Hello and welcome to Science Unscripted. It's Connor here. And Gabe. We're going to start with an email. And uh, this is in reference to an interview, actually our, our last interview, about wisdom. Mm. How you be- How do we become wise? Right. And in, in short, you become wise by interacting with lots of people from different backgrounds and really listening. And going through a lot of different experiences and learning how to deal with those experiences. And so Stuff like that. And stuff like that. <laughs> Adam writes to us, hi, SU. One thing I noticed I had to do in order to become wiser is lose my ego and look at myself in the third person perspective. This improved my ability to regulate emotions, empathize and self-reflect. For me, this was a conscious process. I was forced to do it because of a life changing event I found very difficult to deal with. I had to come up with a way to deal with the very strong emotions I was feeling once I learned to take myself out of my own body and look at myself in the third person, I could more easily regulate my emotions, but as a sort of side bonus, I also noticed I became better at, or rather I actually started doing, empathy and self-reflection. So nice nice tip there. He's Stop and look at yourself from the outside. Describing something, I, I think that the wisdom researchers out there, or the wisdom experts out there, would call self-transcendence. Mm. When you transcend your own self, I, I don't know exactly what that means. We didn't bring that up with the researcher that we were speaking to from Klagenfurt, Austria, but it's it's great that you did, Adam. Yeah. 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 It, no, that's. I think that's healthy for anyone to at least try. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's jump into the science, Gabe. You've got a, a, a quick one? Yeah, well, public service announcement. Uh, this is a study out of the middle of England, Birmingham, England, Aston College. If you are eating Broccoli, which happens. Yeah, raw broccoli at a, at a table with other people. Don't make a face of disgust. <laughs> yeah, at, at least if you're a, a woman. The, the study was looking at 200 women. They were eating raw broccoli while watching video clips of other women eating raw broccoli, and there were three facial expressions uh, on the faces of those those video clips of the people in those video clips, one positive, the other disgust, and the other neutral. This is such a weird setup for an experiment. I'm what I'm sitting eating a, a, anything, really, a, yeah. a cheeseburger, and I have to watch a video of somebody else yeah. eating it and look at it? Anyway. S- social modeling, okay? We yeah. learn what to do and what to like from the people <laughs> around us. And this is just a great example of how how well social modeling works at least in in part so if you're watching someone eating raw broccoli and they have a face of disgust you're really not going to like it regardless of whether you normally like raw broccoli or not if you watch someone eating it and is disgusted by the broccoli who's on a video clip they're not eating the same broccoli you are you're just watching their reaction you will not like the broccoli that you're eating right now what the researchers were were also looking at was what if it's a positive facial expression. So what if you're eating broccoli and you're watching someone eating broccoli and they got a smile on their face? It has no effect. It has no effect. As a matter of fact, it has even also a negative effect. On what? Your bro- we don't like looking at people eating broccoli. smile while, <laughs> well, while, they're, eating, while, while they're eating broccoli. It's also possible. Now that you say that, I, that might be one of those accidentally disturbing video clips. You know those fake smiles? And if somebody's fake smiling while eating broccoli and, so, and you've that, got this I don't want to look at that. Get That's away from me. <laughs> Are you even human? I mean, I, I don't know what the takeaway is here. Maybe just don't ever make a face of disgust, even if you find the broccoli disgusting. And, and also don't smile when you're eating broccoli. Don't do that either. Be conscious of, of the, the effect of social modeling when you're eating something in the, in the company, in the presence of another person. Just try and keep your facial expressions, I guess, to a minimum. It gives me a weapon. Uh, to use against my kids when sometimes one will be eating something and the other one looks at him or at her and is like, eh. Yeah. And you're like, no, A study don't, out of don't. Birmingham, England, you know, tells us... Tells you not to do that. Not, it, it's not. Do that. It's not dad saying no, it's Birmingham, England. Especially with regard to raw vegetables. I'm left wondering why that study was gendered in the way it was, but let's leave it at that because it works for um, what I'm about to talk about next. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, and we finished our last episode asking our listeners to talk about veganism. How Mm -hmm. do they feel about it? Mm -hmm. We had one person write in, um, and he had wonderful things to say about this show, saying two random yanks talking science in Deutschland really works somehow. The half hour leaves him wanting more, quirky, informative. It's this magic and this mystery. Thank you, you curious strangers, you. Magic and mystery. (laughs) 
Uh, I believe those words are in the in the Gummy Bears cartoon uh. intro song, Ma- the Magic and Mystery. Anyway, what he says is, I really respect and admire vegans, just maybe not as much as they'd like me to. S- but seriously, folks, I don't eat much meat, but really like it when I splurge two or three times a month. And that uh, to... Uh, uh, the sign-off was CB. I, don't, I can't recall who sent this, but um, that makes you oddly like Arnold Schwarzenegger, the way you're eating right now. And I'll get to that toward the end here. But this is uh, kind of relevant right now because we're in what apparently is called by some people Veganuary. Mm-hmm. That's what is that? A, a social media campaign where people are are trying to get through January. Eating vegan, eating a yeah. vegan diet, and then and then like just, just to try it out. Yeah, like dry January with alcohol. Yeah, which I'm kind of doing right now. Um, there you go. Yeah, this is set up by a UK nonprofit. Apparently, 400,000 people did this back in 2020, so it's it's kind of significant. And uh, real quick, I know most people are kind of generally aware of this, but it's worth repeating. A lot of benefits in being vegan. Mm-hmm. Uh, I myself am not. I went kind of vegetarian for a while, and now I'm mixed. But if you're vegan, it's there are 75% less climate heating emissions as a result of your eating behaviors. That's that's gigantic. 75% less, 66% less destruction of wildlife, 50% less water. It's also better for your health. It just all around better for your health. Lower heart disease, lower blood pressure, lower diabetes, lower obesity, and you burn more calories even if you do no more exercise because of the kinds of things you're eating. They're not stored as fat. That's but what you were looking into is what people think about vegans, right? Correct, correct. And um, last thing I'll say here just real quick is that, yeah. of course, any of you considering this diet or this lifestyle, it, actually it's really just a diet, talk to your physician because you might end up with vitamin deficiencies. deficiencies. It's calcium, vitamin B, vitamin B12, omega-3, et etc. et cetera. Mm-hmm. Talk and make sure you have a good plan for doing this if you do it. And of course, there's the animal welfare issue. Anyway, um, Polish study from the end of 2023 yeah. was trying to figure out how do other people feel about vegetarians and vegans. A survey of Poles, what they think about vegans, their yes. image of a vegan. Yes, 1,000 Polish people uh-huh. were, were surveyed. Yeah. And uh, the first part was about your romantic relationship. What would happen if your partner went vegetarian or vegan? And there, the guys were not that happy with it. The guys, the guys don't really like it. Their uh, female partner. If their female partner were to go vegetarian or vegan, 35% of men said they would be unhappy. So one out of three men in Poland would just not like that situation compared to 28% of women. Um, 24% of men said it would decrease the quality of the relationship compared to just 15% of women. And this one uh, asked, would it decrease the attractiveness of your partner? 22% of men said, yes, it would. 13% of women um, also agreed with that statement. So in general... So this is loaded then. 22% said their their female partner would be less attractive. If they went, if they had one of these diets. And so you can see guys are, at least in Poland... But generally speaking, this is this is kind of true around the world. Guys are less inclined to become vegan than uh, than women are, or, or they hold stronger negative attitudes. Mm-hmm. And around the world, UK, US, Germany, for every one vegan male, there are anywhere from two or three or even four vegan females. Way more women are vegan than men. And that's what this study was really about. It's about the gender stereotypes. And where it got interesting was they got they had these Polish um, focus groups, just 36 people, but they wanted to talk to vegans and vegetarians. Like, how do you, how do you actually experience this? In depth. Yeah. In, yeah, in depth in the real world. Just a couple quotes real quickly here. Um, one guy who's a vegetarian said, you know, basically everyone's just like, why don't you eat meat? They're critical of him. And they tend to think that he's doing it just to be cool, just to be fashionable because it's like hip or trendy right now. Um, another guy who's a vegan had even stronger association said people who uh, who know you're vegan assume you're, you're aggressive. They've seen these videos of vegans um, occupying places and, and defending their their diet. Yeah. And there was a woman um, who's a vegetarian. Her response was that she even realized in becoming vegetarian that she held certain stereotypes. For example, that men, uh, she was surprised when a male, uh, the male partner of her dietitian, turned out to have climbed Mount Everest. And she's like, whoa. You know, Despite being vegan. Dis- in, 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 vegetarian. in his case, vegetarian. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so there are a lot of prejudices. Uh, And one of them goes on to talk about how it's linked to masculinity and that it's unmanly not to eat. A lot of 
ingrained, deeply ingrained prejudices that are keeping guys, unfortunately, from going vegan. I say unfortunately, I'm not pr- trying to promote it. It's just for every new vegan out there, I benefit. I bet the world, the world, the, the world yeah. benefits. I, I mean, in that sense, it's a it's a positive for that person's health. It's a positive for the world. It's a positive for animals. So in that sense, sure, go ahead and do it. Mm-hmm. But there are a lot of things standing in the way that are stopping guys from doing it, unfortunately. And so at the end of the study, this is kind of the last thing I'll say here. Uh, they're perceived as a minority group, vegetarians and vegans. They're the targets of prejudice and discrimination and that this is a barrier for people to transition. And one of the best things that can happen for men is, and I, again, I'm referencing men because there aren't enough of them or it's disproportionate, mm-hmm. is to have a role model to yeah. do it. And for me, I remember it vividly. His name was Scott Jurek. He's an ultra runner, happens to be from the area that I grew up in. And he was vegan and winning all these races at a time where that was really unusual. I'm talking like, I think back in the 90s. Mm. Uh, and that was a, that, that was the first time I realized, holy cow, you can... You can do that. And so I'm just going to list five athletes that people out there might know, not know are vegans. Um, one of them is the tennis player Venus Williams. I had no idea that she was vegan. No. Another one is Novak Djokovic. If I'm saying his name right, I'm not a tennis Champion fan. Champion tennis player. He's yeah. number one in the world. <laughs> Serbian guy. Lewis Hamilton, the number one F1 driver in the world, has a vegan lifestyle, vegan diet. Dirk Nowitzki, which Germans are very, <laughs> very proud of him. Yeah. Um, NBA basketball player, former NBA basketball player, and back to Arnold Schwarzenegger, who has an 80% vegan lifestyle. The guy who embodies gigantic muscles, yeah. 80% vegan. It's well, possible. Patrick Baboumi, I'm here in Germany. There's a weightlifter who is vegan, and that the the hate that he gets online, people saying that he's using steroids. And it just doesn't believe that he can have the muscles and be as strong as he is by eating vegan. Yeah, yeah so he knows all about that. It's possible. And if you, it's kind of a weird thing to say, but if you want to still keep those, you know, quote unquote, masculine ideals and be a big, strong, manly man, you can do it and be vegan. And there are a lot of great examples out there. And that's it. Just real quick, some science on fear. That's scary. Oh, there's a picture of a large spider on a, I believe, a man's that's the, that's the barn funnel weaver. Do you have arachnophobia? I've got arachnophobia. I've seen the movie, but uh, and it, it actually did scare me yeah. back in the, it was like a movie from the 80s, but I've, no, I don't have. We have spoken about uh, the fear of clowns. Uh, that was in the middle of last year, I forget when. Research out of Germany on phobias. They took people who are afraid of spiders and afraid of heights, right? You have to be afraid of both. Established to, to particip- participate in the study, they found 50 people. They look, It started at 171, got it down to 50. They, they're they afraid of spiders and height. I guess that's not the strangest combination. Yeah. It's a very common phobia, both now, of them. The, okay, here's the experiment. They gave them exposure therapy, but only for the fear of spiders. So they treated the fear of spiders uh, by step by step forcing these people closer and closer to the spider and at the end of it if they could they were then you know had the spider on their hand wow yeah they did not treat the fear of heights so they had people walk up a cathedral in Bochum Germany and before being treated for the fear of spiders they tested out how far up they could a Keith cathedral they could get Oh, yeah, they, you can measure, measure the steps. They walked up the spiral steps yeah. of a cathedral. Very scary, even if, even if you don't have acrophobia, which is fear of heights. Anyways, after having been treated with exposure therapy to the fear of, for the fear of spiders, their fear of heights went down. So they were, they were able to go up 15% more steps after having zero treatment for that fear of heights. Ah, uh, interesting. Yeah. So they, they learned that they were, possibly, that they were able to overcome a fear in general, and hence this other fear may be overcomable. However it happened, it means now that when you treat one fear or one phobia, it might help with other phobias that might lead to universal universal approaches when it comes to fear reduction or fear therapy. Could and it, be big out of Bochum. Yeah, and it would it would suggest that if you've got a basket of fears, and most people have more than one fear. That's right. Anxiety can, does, is, is normally, there's more than just one of them. Yeah. So treating one can help all the others. That's according to this research, yeah. And we've got one last email on wisdom, right? This was from Kai. What do you got there? Kai sent us a link to Bible verses, to the to the Holy Bible. Job, right? Job, book of Job. Book, yeah, Book of Job, twenty-eight. And in the in these twenty-eight um, lines of text, basically, Job is is using mining 
the idea of digging precious metals and, and gemstones out of the earth mm -hmm. as an analogy for trying to find wisdom. This goes back to that wisdom study. And he basically concludes that you can find things like, you know, gold and crystal and topaz and silver and coral and... Wait, topaz? Onyx and <laughs> onyx. lapis lazuli in the ground. But you can't find wisdom. You can't find it. You can't dig it up. The only way to get it, he says, is through God. And this is going to connect to uh, the next interview that we're about to do here. But Gabe, why don't you read those verses? Where then does wisdom come from? Where does understanding dwell? It is hidden from the eyes of every living thing, concealed even from the birds in the sky. And he said to the human race, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. What? And to shun <laughs> evil is understanding. I hadn't read, I don't know, or I'd read that part too quick. So that's, what, that's what Job claims is wisdom, fearing, fearing God. Mm -hmm. I don't, yeah, we, well. We're going to look into religion and what kids think about God when it tells something to them in a little bit. Yeah, that's, that's what we're about to do here. Uh, it, before we do, it's important to just say that Job's wrong. We could it's have asked. We, we could have asked her about you know whether the fear of the Lord is the way to a, a, attain wisdom. That would have been interesting to hear her response. Yeah. So that's up next. And if any of you, in the meantime, have anything to say on veganuary or being vegetarian or vegan or how to eat broccoli mm. or other things in front of other people, please get in touch. We are su at dw.com. Science unscripted.